Hi, this is Professor Lusheen. This is lecture 14 for Safety 388. Uh, I'm going to begin with or complete the uh, PowerPoint deck that we used uh, in lecture 13 when we were talking about uh, powered industrial trucks, forklifts, and warehouse safety. Now we're going to kind of advance it to um, the lifting of heavier or larger objects. So under 1910-179, it kind of goes over what's required. Um, so I'm just going to give you a basic definition, even though I'm going to show you pictures later, is that there are different types of crane. If you think of an overhead crane, there's either the overhead or bridge crane in which there is a, a static structure in which the crane then moves back and forth on a very heavy beam. The other is a gantry train, gantry crane, excuse me, in which the crane is on wheels and then the wheels move back and forth. So the difference is whether it's a static built-in structure or uh, one that is on a um, kind of on a guide rail that goes back and forth or has either wheels or cams. Uh, cranes are covered by B ANC B30.2. They do need to have their laid load ratings on them. Uh, they do need to be tested. Uh, no load should ever be lifted above another's head. And so just like with fork trucks, I've seen more and more overhead and gantry cranes having the blue spotlight to indicate where it's moving to. And it just helps people be aware of where it's going. Other things in the standard talks about the cab, so the controls, where it's located. Sometimes there's a person who is up in a cab and they're moving with the crane itself. Um, other times it's a drop down control station and so the operator is actually moving with the crane itself. Um, it addresses where people can be moving, where there can be ladders or protrusions, uh, stops, bumpers, rail sweeps, all these things are meant to keep it from things from falling off or for it to operate properly, a brake in case you want to stop, and any sort of other equipment. Uh, it talks about what you're going to use for the actual lifts, warning devices, uh, how periodically you're supposed to and frequently you're supposed to inspect it and test it, maintenance, rope inspection or sling inspection is what it really should say. Um, edu you know, it has to address the, the lifting of loads. I mean, it's not only just, okay, this is a five ton uh, rated crane, therefore we can pick up anything that's under five tons uh, because objects, objects, when you put the sling on it, um, and it's lifted, it may shift weight, uh, in which case, you know, it, it can actually be heavier than what the original object is, because when things shift, if you want to talk about, um, you know, accelerations and stuff like that, it can actually change it. And when things become a little bit, you know, when the balance changes, things become off kilter and things can fall. And we want to prevent things from falling. So we're just going to go over a few here. Crawler cranes are, are, are typically derricks but they usually have cams and then they're the ones that are mobile and move about. Locomotive cranes, that's something that would actually be on a bed and then the bed is moved. Uh, there's wheel mounted cranes, that's, you know, that's mobile. You're, they're probably more of a jib. A jib is when you have a post and you have, a, you have an arm that comes out and they, they tend to be smaller, just like a ton to maybe two to three tons. I uh, have an electric motor and usually see them like in welding shops or assembly shops or CNC shops. Um, it says truck and self-propelled. Yeah, we have those. Uh, sometimes they're powered by co internal combustion engines. That's when you need more power, electric power, uh, lower um, uh, weights. Uh, let's see. Gives you another ANSI standard. More about loading capacities, testing. And I'm going to get into all these things. A derrick, on the other hand, is more of a... Um, uh, a framed and not a solid uh, arm and usually the power comes from um, a crank which goes from the top of the cab over the top of the derrick and back, back down again. We'll see some pictures of them. The slings we're going to get into. They're usually made of a synthetic or a metal and so there's metal mesh, there's um, uh, metal alloy chain, wire rope, and then the synthetics can be either webbing or fibered rope. And I'm going to, I've got a video that'll explain all the different types of rigging or slings. They call them different things. Sometimes they call them straps. Um, cause not all devices have this nice little hook that you can hook onto. A lot of them, you have to fashion your own, um, uh, sling in order to do it. It talks about different things you can do. Slings always have to be inspected for either damage 
or um, indication that it's being overused. And that's where um, like the synthetic webbing can become rubbed away or a chain link can be elongated or some of the uh, wire rope, a couple of them can break. There, there's, there's indications of, um, of overuse in which they needed to be taken out of service. Not only taken about out of service, but damaged and then taken out of service. Because if you just throw a somewhat damaged but looks okay sling in the garbage, sometimes people yank them back out again. That's a very common thing. Uh, there are other components too. There, there's the metal pieces that connect the, um, what do you want to call it, the, the hook? for lack of a better term, uh, to the sling. And so, and sometimes you have to attach different pieces. And so those also have ratings. Those also have to be inspected for elongation or damage. Uh, let's see. And yeah, so that's a real brief overview of things you typically won't have to deal with. Um, but whenever you are working in a plant that is either moving or producing heavy equipment, uh, then you need someone who has expertise uh, and they actually have to know quite a bit about statics and dynamics So any of you have taken physics before uh, there is there is the weight and um, You know when the weight shifts or when you wrap something around it the configuration um, Indicates what weight is going to go on what part of the sling and you have to know what its maximum capacity is You may have to use multiple slings you can determine that max capacity. As things are actually moving, there may be some additional on it. Um, you know, there, there's a lot that goes into it. I want to quickly go through, and the, don't I don't want this to frighten you, because this is 143 slides. We're not going to go over through all 143. This is just meant to kind of guide the discussion. This was created as part of a grant through OSHA um, by the Hennepin, Count, Hennepin Technical College. And we're not going to get into this stuff. So rigging, I provided a few videos of, uh, actually just one. It's called Big Blue. I don't, you guys are familiar with Miller Park, right? Do you remember when the uh, crane broke? Well, um, the OSHA inspector who was on site at the time is the one who shot the video footage of part of the roof come tumbling down. I think there were two fatalities in that incident. It's just they were trying to do a lift in too high of a wind. And as soon as a, a lift, especially a sophisticated lift like that, I think it had multiple cranes operating at once. If one starts to go, they all go. That's a very typical thing. There, You could search YouTube. There are more than just a few crane accidents. Um, and it's usually uh, when a crane is starting to move something, it's moving too fast, there may be some sway or movement, or the object they're trying to lift or move uh, it becomes a little off balance or shifts a little bit, and then the whole thing goes down. There, uh, The general industry stuff tends to be more towards jib, gantry, and overhead cranes. The construction tends to be more with the... Uh, the mobile type cranes and derricks. And then there's also the tower cranes, probably what you're more used to that has a structure that goes straight up and then on top it sits and then there's a cab up there and then the device goes back and forth and they do the lifts and then they, they spin on the axis of the tower. You usually see those with the construction of big uh, buildings or tall buildings. So we are mostly just talking about subpart N under 1910, but some of the things that are provided under the canvas uh, heading uh, for lecture 14 does kind of touch on to the construction stuff as well. So here is the breakdown of the S ASME, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, slings, hooks, things like that. So let's go over some terms. So lifting, that's a pretty basic one, but you can see right here, they have a specialized um, uh, uh, arm with, with two down lines for lifting whatever that object is. Here it's a little bit more sophisticated. This looks like it may actually be at a building. Um, you've got two separate derrick cranes doing uh, two-sided lift and there's something called working load limit and depending on the orientation and what you're doing that needs to be calculated by an expert and there's actually quite a bit of math in calculating these things, especially since you need a professional engineer to do a, um, a load uh, design or lift design when it gets really sophisticated. There are minimum design factors. It's a five to one for a lot of these things. And then depending, so 
this is comes through the inspection of the metal chain if it's elongated or broken or somewhat depressed you may have to take it out of service reach is another thing the all these things need to have tags on them too that's a big thing that if the tag somehow gets separated or removed you can have an expert come in and rate it and put on a new tag but you can't use it while a tag is missing you got to take it out of service this is a sling hitch basically a vertical you can see the hook, you can see the actual, it looks like a nylon strap uh, connected to the object. This, this is vertical. Then there's choker in which you'd wrap around it. I think in the video they talk about how you tend to use the synthetics when you don't want to damage the object, but when it's a heavy object they really can't sustain damage because it's usually made of metal, that's when you used the, uh, the metal slings. This is called choker. And then the last one is basket. And depending on the orientation, of the sling, it dictates uh, what its new maximum uh, capacity is. There are different definitions. There's designated person, competent person, qualified person. The qualified person typically is the most trained and is overseeing the lift. Competent, they receive some training. They can basically work on it. Designated is really probably a standby or, or a spotter. Okay. Qualified to perform certain duties, competent and qualified. Uh, competent means one who's capable of identifying. Qualified means someone who possessed or recognized the degree of certificate. So without even knowing that was coming up, that was what I pretty much meant. Unattended, yeah, uh, condition which operator of a hoist is not, is not at or within 16 feet of the operating controlling device. Hoist, something is just basic lift, lift and haul tend to see those in the work environment uh, regardless of the load you hoist okay so they've got a lot of different examples here or hoist within uh, we're not even gonna talk about helicopters hoist safe how heavy is it <laughs> determine load weight sometimes you have to estimate that um, when I have my friend Corey Goldschmidt come in from um, Bleed Bolt, he, um, he goes through several examples and brings in different objects. And there are different calculations you can use based on sort of a density slash volume calculation. Um, and you should always estimate a little bit higher. Yeah, basically what Corey talks about. We're not going to do the worksheet problem. Next one is operating limits. So that you're talking about the actual device itself. And so you, yeah, basically you go by the manufacturer, but there are also um, some guidance within the OSHA standard and I believe ANSI or AST, ASMT, is that right? Oh, raid, load radius, which is interesting too, is sometimes they can lift things up and then if they try to extend it out, it becomes too heavy and pulls the entire thing down. There, you can use things such as outriggings, but sometimes you need anchor points for the outriggings. Here's the thing. Let's say you pick up a gallon of milk and hold it right here. You could probably hold it for quite a while. If you were to extend it full arm out, you wouldn't be able to hold it as long because there's, there's, there's more moment weight on the, the shoulder itself. It's the same sort of principle when it comes to lifting with cranes. The further you get away from its center point or its um, center of gravity, the more capacity it puts on. So some they use outriggers or they use counterbalance weights in order to do a heavier lift. But everything has its capacity and you have to calculate it. There's a lot of tables to interpret, a lot of figures to interpret when it comes to this. Sling capacity is another issue. In the video, they'll go over all this stuff. Load bearing material talks about the different metal and synthetics, uh, upper and lower end attachments. These are the chain slings. Okay, chain test. I know I've had friends who contact me and they've actually, um, because their slings were all kind of old, they actually hired a contractor to come in in, in order to inspect and then re-tag everything. And um, I actually, I'm gonna, I provided the link to them. They're out of Milwaukee. Talks about the elongation requirements or limitations depending on the grade of the steel. Load limit, 
depends on conditions. Heat can also affect metal. Uh, there you go. Gives you the percentages. And we've got the wire ropes. They can. It's pretty easy to damage these. Here's different um, configurations for connections. You never, you never tie a sling. As soon as you put a knot in something, you reduce its capacity by fifty percent. And especially with the um, the wire ropes, the configuration and how it attaches to you know whatever the end of it is dictates its strength. And you can see right here, it's got the list of efficiencies based on. Um, how it's set up. You don't see wire mesh, or at least I haven't seen it as much, or my friends haven't said they've used this as much. Synthetics are much more common. They have the two kinds, flat tubular or round slings. That's, and they're, they're color coding. Um, they've got usually a, um, a wire thread that's on the inside of it, and when the fiber becomes, when the exterior fiber becomes damaged and you can see the red thread, you're supposed to dispose of it, get, take it out of service because the term is red is dead. It'll break. So the configuration indicates what its capacity is. You never want to bend it too much. And we're not just talking about the slings themselves, but actually the attachments onto the hook of the crane. This is, it, it's, it's complex. You got to do inspections. You got to keep records of those inspections. Sling angle is a big deal. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's the that's the advice there. So if you have a shorter sling and it's connected to the edges, it's not going to be able to withstand as much as one that's got a uh, more of a vertical. So the more, as you reduce the, the vertical orientation, the less it can hold. Straight up and down is, is its strongest uh, orientation. Not going to do the worksheet problem. So they're talking about different great alloy slings and all this other stuff. I mean, you you always should work in some sort of safety factor as well when you do these calculations because you just don't know um, what sort of additional stress will be on all the components when it's in motion. I remember seeing a video once, you know people who, you ever heard of the term bridge swinging? Where people, you know, tie a line and then they jump off and then they swing, you know, fr from a bridge? Well, they were trying to do a group one and they did a calculation. They knew what the, um, the limit, the weight limit was for the line they put on and they knew the weight of the people, but what they didn't take into effect is as it's swinging down, there's an acceleration force being put onto it. So as you're moving downward, it pushed more and it snapped the line. They did a, they obviously failed physics class for more than one reason. Unequal legs is another difficult thing, but you just do it by its position. I could do this stuff. I'm not gonna force you guys to do this stuff. I'm not testing you on math, not today. Having a good dis dis distribution of how you're connecting your sling and the lift just makes it better. And then you always lift and bring it slow and never lift it more than you have to. Keep the coast clear. Load stability, another big deal. Center of gravity is a big deal. You don't want it to shift during the lift. Uh, let's see. Yeah, make sure lines don't get... Yeah, sometimes you have a uh, spotter or a guide. You've seen this, probably seen this before, in which they tie a rope or a line to the load. And that person's job is to, <coughs> excuse me, keep the load as stable as possible as it moves. Because if it has a tendency to, to turn and swing, that can put extra stress or possibly cause it to fall. Um, same thing when you're lifting. You're not supposed to lift in windy conditions. That That's really bad, too. Should block off all pathways so nobody's walking under it. You don't want to be hoisting something over expensive equipment either. You might want to put up protective overhead. Standard signals, we don't have to get into the signals. Um, a former student of mine said that he, they used to use um, lifts when they had a, um, a cage to lift someone from one part of the building to the other. Uh, the hand signal was 
which was up, asshole. <laughs> he told me that. I thought that was funny. Uh, is the area clear of people? There should be constant communication between the crane operator and the people down on the, um, on the lift area. Can the load be thrown, flown, or landed? We're not going to talk about that. Swing travel. And then the final one is how will the environment affect the safety of the lift? So weather, terrain. We had kind of addressed these before. Does it say what the wind has to be? I thought it was under 30 miles per hour, maybe 25 depending on terrain. Yeah, another thing I've seen is when people do lifts like for bridges, if they try to set up next to like on a bridge embankment, um, you don't want to rely on the soil, especially if the soil can roll away. So you actually have to build um, a, an anchor point or a foundation or a footing in which to attach or to place on top of the outriggers. So, Because if that ground starts to shift or go down, the whole thing is going into the river. There's videos of that as well. Yeah, corrosives can affect the, uh, the material. Yeah. And this is just some other advice. I see I'm over 20 minutes. Good, we got through it. We definitely hit the main points of what I had wanted to cover. Other than, so you can take a look at these crane from the bolt. These are very sophisticated. He barely finishes them within the time allotted of an hour, 15 minute. That's why I didn't want to touch it. Um, the blue... Big blue crane accident, watch that, it's a couple minutes long. Again, it was taken by an OSHA inspector at the time. And actually I met the guy, he's still in Wisconsin, he does consulting work now. Uh, please, yes, I'm definitely gonna say must watch. Sling base, it's for 24 minutes, but they do a really, really good job of um, going over the different types of slings. And it's really important information. When, it, when you talk about it, it's more relevant to the 1910 standards than just the uh, the construction and then a link to the to the Wisconsin lift specialists really good stuff as well they were very helpful they did a, um, a session for the American Society of Safety Professionals a few years ago found them to be very knowledgeable and then as far as what the cranes look like so here's an overhead it's a 35 ton uh, but then you've got another um, crane here lifting for it a gantry again has it has wheels or is on a track and they move back and forth it could be wheels or, or cams uh, a jib crane see you've got a, a structure here and an extension arm and it can be swung around i've seen more of these than anything else although overhead cranes depending then you have to have an entire bay that's open that can be moved back and forth uh freestanding crane tends to be an overhead or a bridge crane uh, monorail crane, so it can be actually on whatever you want to design it. Uh, traveling bridge and other things. To, so let's go to this one. So we've got the mobile crane. It's on wheels and it lifts up. Telescoping crane, so the arm goes up and actually can extend out. The typical one you see around the construction of buildings is the tower crane. Person climbs up, gets in the cab, and then they're up there on radio moving things around. Uh, one that's loaded on, actually attached onto a truck. This is usually for loading and unloading, just onto the truck. Uh, rough terrain just has you know uh, more rugged wheels or cams in order to get places that a ve regular vehicle can't. Got a, um, a boom crane, overhead crane. These can be either again gantry or bridge. That's really everything I wanted to cover. We're under 25 minutes, which is good. I want you to look, watch those videos, kind of just look at the materials. If it ever comes up, then you know to go to it. Uh, Cause you have to, I just really, what I want you to take away is how sophisticated it is to actually um, design a lift, especially heavy lifts. Whereas we kind of take those things for granted when we're just using a forklift or a, um, a pallet jack, or other things we just use like in a warehouse. This stuff is much more sophisticated, but you may come in contact with it. One rule of thumb as I use is never lift over somebody. You just never know if that thing's gonna like, you know, fall or whatever. You gotta keep the coast clear, um, but there is plenty of training, inspection, maintenance, and all that stuff, and you remember the three different designations uh, that OSHA gives. So, um, thank you very much.